you know, very often uh, you th when you think about things like climate change, uh, you think, well, that's really going to be bad for people in the Sahara and uh, in Africa and in desert regions where, and you know, that's going to be tough for them. But we'll be okay because we got, you know, all kinds of government help and facilities, money that will protect us against these uh, extreme events. Um, but our speaker today, David Paget, uh, is going to explain how we're not really uh, safe just by being here rather than there. It's going to affect all of us and maybe already is affecting all of us. Uh, and I think it's really a great lesson to realize that we can't escape from these global um, consequences just by being better off and living in a great city um, in this country. David is uh, the uh, Associate Professor of um, uh, Geography at TSU. He's, uh, he's taught at Vanderbilt and he's taught at uh, Oberlin with uh, David Orr. Uh, taught a course on environmental justice uh, there. He is a teacher and a scholar and an activist. And I don't know if you remember my one of my first speakers about 11 years ago, Beth Conklin, who wrote a book on cannibalism. She was very worried that she, about talking about this topic. She thought she might get like eaten by the eaten alive by the audience. Um, she said she heard David talk at a uh, teaching, and we just had to have him in in our program. So uh, I got in touch with him. He is interested in. I guess he's a cultural geographer. I don't know if that's the right word for you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm just, I'm trying. Um, and he's interested in things like obesity, in um, the ways in which toxic waste gets uh, disposed of, and the kinds of political and social considerations that happen there. And he's interested in food deserts. Food deserts are not like the Sahara, where you have a real desert, but they're places where you can't get good food. And he's trying, in Nashville, and he's trying, he's part of a long program to try and uh, locate those sites and areas and try and figure out how to, how to change things. Um, so um, without further ado, I'm going to uh, invite David to talk to us today. Uh, and the title of his talk, strictly speaking, is um, Global Climate Change, Vulnerability, next door. And I should add that he's, as well as being at, at TSU, he's uh, director of the, the Geo Information Sciences Lab, and he runs a multifaceted environmental consulting firm, so if you need some consultation, come to him, called Geo Mental. I guess it's like environmental. Anyway, David. Well, good afternoon. So, again, so I'm a geographer, and geography is a little bit difficult to define because it's such a holistic discipline. Uh, and so when I started out, I was primarily what we call a physical geographer, which is uh, more of an earth scientist. And so I, my background is in geology, geomorphology, hydrogeology, spent a lot of time studying groundwater, soils, and that kind of thing. Uh, when I taught at Vanderbilt for the first time in the 1990s, I was actually in the geology department. And I taught hydrogeology and environmental geology. Uh, but then I moved away. I went to Oberlin College for a while, taught environmental studies there, came back to Tennessee State University. Uh, and Tennessee State University has no semblance of an earth science program. Uh, and so I built upon my background in urban geography. And so a lot of our problems and issues and concerns in urban areas are directly related to the environment, to the physical environment. And so I've had a lot of opportunities to look at uh, the hydrology of Nashville, air quality. I got involved with the whole thermal plant thing, if you all remember thermal, uh, old thermal. So it's really a, um, the, the human land tradition and geography really comes together in urban environments. And so this talk, 
uh, is going to speak specifically about that. Uh, when we think about global climate change, we think of it being this big global thing that might not necessarily impact us or our neighbors, especially when we live in cities. We get this false sense of security. Um, however, uh, with the majority of the world's population living in cities for the first time, I mean, prior to approximately a couple of years ago, the majority of the world's population lived in urban areas. But now we see more and more people moving to cities for a variety of reasons. Uh, and when we think of cities in, in other parts of the world, it's not like here. You know, people are moving into favelas or slums or shanty towns or unplanned communities. Uh, and so their vulnerability to climate change and storms and rain and flooding and landslides is significantly higher or becoming increasingly higher as we're going to see increasingly more extreme weather events occurring uh, during this era of global climate change, which I guess is the politically correct term. Global warming is the actual term, but you know, I'll just use them interchangeably here. Uh, so what I've been looking at over the past uh, several years has been the impact of extreme weather events upon our community here in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, and so we're looking in this case at vulnerability. You know, are all of our communities at the same level of risk? Well, of course not. Uh, and so I'm going to start with a more of a, quanti a qualitative look at this issue, and then I'm going to move into more of a qu quantitative approach. Um, my colleague, my co-author, um, uh, Dr. Nia Fodderingham, uh, is very busy. She's an MD, so she's not able to make it a lot of places. And thankfully, her patients are thankful for that. Uh, but she's a co-author here. She was um, at medical, Harry Medical College at the time that we were working on this project. Okay. So we all remember this, Hurricane Katrina, New Orleans. Uh, it really exposed us to the fact that certain populations are more vulnerable to these kind of events than others. Uh, especially when you think of the fact that the evacuation f plan for New Orleans actually worked as far as they were concerned, but it didn't work from a humane standpoint, obviously. Uh, if you did not own an automobile, it didn't work for you. Uh, if you did not expect to spend four and five days in the convention center or the Superdome, it didn't work for you. Uh, and we really saw this um, uh, here in, in New Orleans. Uh, and it really exposed us to looking at how do we prepare m more vulnerable communities for these extreme weather events. So we started to look here in Nashville. I said, well, do we have a vulnerable population here in Nashville? Well, anytime we study vulnerability or poverty or anything, chances are you're going to use the 37208 zip code area. And you can read about some of the, uh, uh, I guess, parameters uh, regarding the population and their demographic and socioeconomic status. But as you can see, significant numbers of residents in this community don't have vehicles available. And the typical evacuation plan is what? Get in your car and leave. You know, what if you don't have a car? Uh, lots of poverty uh, and other, lots of dependence upon public transit uh, in the 37208 zip code area. And so that was our area of focus that we were looking at. And the main thing we wanted to look at was this thing that we call inner city emergency response, uh, because that, that's what came out of the wake of Hurricane Katrina. So the Red Cross and FEMA and all these other organizations started to do these inner city emergency response workshops. Well, around 2008, uh, we had one at Tennessee State University. It was led by the Red Cross. And so I asked the person leading the workshop, where are the Red Cross shelters in Nashville? And he said, well, they're all over town. I said, well, where are they? He said, well, they're everywhere in Nashville. I said, I'm a geographer. Do you have a map? He <laughs> said, no. I said, you don't have a map of where your shelters are, your Red Cross shelters? He said, no, we don't. So at the time, after Hurricane Katrina, uh, I'd been working with Pearl Cone High School, and we got a uh, Pretty significant, well, significant, it was $15,000. It doesn't sound like a lot of money, but for, for any high school, $15,000 is a lot of money. So we built the Geographic Information Systems Lab at Pearl Cone High School, uh, and the uh, State Farm 
Good Neighbor Service Learning Grant uh, largely came out of the, um, you know, in, I hate to say in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, but that's, I do. In the wake of Hurricane Katrina, um, no pun intended, um, you know, we were, these, these grants became available. And they were primarily to go to schools to help young people uh, develop their skills in inner city emergency response. And being a geographer, I added GIS into that mix. And you'll see how important GIS is uh, in this, um, as we continue through this presentation. So the lab, State Farm Insurance Company, was already at Pearl Cone High School. We had already built a GIS lab there in about 2006. Uh, and so I told the Red Cross, I said, well, my ninth graders at Pearl Cone High School are gonna make your maps. And that's what this project was all about. So you don't have to read all this, but basically this, this is where the project started. So we got the grant. Uh, my, my students at TSU, and, and as, as part of a service learning project in my weather and climate and urban geography class, uh, they were taught GIS and weather studies from me, and then they in turn had to go to Pearl Cone High School and impart that knowledge onto those ninth graders, which they didn't want to do. You know, even though a lot of my students had just gotten out of high school, they didn't want to go back. Uh, and I told them, I said, you know, I own a consulting firm. Uh, a lot of these ninth graders are going to ask you the same questions that my clients ask me. Doc, I can't find my map on the screen. Where did it go? Doc, where are my data? I can't find them. Doc, they're going to ask you the exact same questions. And you should be prepared to ask questions or else you're, that's how you serve the community, being able to answer questions. Uh, and so, so we did that, and the students actually learned GIS, and, and they, we had a really good teacher, always mentioned uh, uh, Ms. Hirsch, she's still in Metro Schools now, and of course the uh, State Farm for supplying the funds. Uh, we had other, a lot of other people, uh, Ms. Uh, Bev Jacobs was very instrumental in helping this project along, we could not have done it without Bev Jacobs. Uh, Pearl, this is just real quick, always have to have some GIS in here, uh, we actually trained the uh, students at Pearl Cone using these very good learning modules that were provided by the, the uh, uh, university in um, uh, George Mason, no, James Madison University in Virginia. I was, I was too confused. But this is a free online curriculum for learning GIS, and one of the modules was actually entitled Disasters, so it was perfect, a perfect fit. And so here's one of my students, that's Curtis Green. He actually emailed me yesterday. Uh, he's doing great things in Atlanta now. This was like four or five years ago. And here he is. This is a handheld GPS unit training the Pearl Cone High School students. And then here are my students over in the lab. This is Kendra Smith. She's an engineer in Cincinnati now. Uh, I can't remember her name. Uh, Scales. Scales is a, uh, is a metro school teacher. So here's some of the, this is the GIS lab we built at Pearl Cone, another one of my students. Um, and I tell my students, that it's more important that they're at Pearl Cone, if you, if you know anything about Pearl Cone, an African American ninth grade at Pearl Cone only has a one in three chance of graduating. Uh, and so we talk about role models. I really can't be a role model for this student. I'm, I'm almost 50 years old. You know, that's three lifetimes for this guy. But, or the, but this young lady who might be 16, uh, you know, she can be Katasia Jordan. She might say, well, maybe in four years I can be Katasia Jordan. Maybe instead of joining a gang or becoming a mother at 16, I'll be like Katasia Jordan and be at TSU in four years. They can see four years. They can't see 40 some years in advance. So, um, so that's why I say it's much more important for you all to be here. Oh, Katasia Jordan just got her master's degree in planning from UT Austin. And this student, his name is Keith. I can never, just never remember his last name. He just graduated. He just, just got his master's from Vanderbilt. So. Uh, it's great for those people to be over there. So that's what we were doing, that's me. This is what we started out with. This is what we got from the Red Cross. This is what we called in GIS an attribute database, just paper, lots of information about the shelters, square footage, capacity, so on and so forth. This is what we started out with. We had to convert this into electronic format using Excel. None of these ninth graders had ever used Excel, never used Word, didn't know anything about the micro Microsoft uh, platform or Microsoft Office. Knew every game in the world, every game. But, so it was really good to expose them to this software. So the, and we had 72 shelters at that time in Nashville, and we had 18 students, so it worked out perfectly. Each student 
got to build a mini database with four shelters. Nobody got five and somebody got three. No, everybody had the same amount. So I weaved them together, so here are the students' names. So I had to, that's just an extra field, just so that the students could see their names in the database. Uh, and so here where all the shelters were and back then in 2008. So we built that uh, database, and then I'm gonna flash forward and we converted it into maps. So I'm, I left out a whole lot of steps, but this was the result. So those ninth graders in May of 2009 produced the first maps of Nashville's Red Cross emergency shelters. And so here's one of the maps. No, the maps did not exist. So those ninth graders at Pearl Cone High School, uh, they made the Red Cross first maps. Uh, don't clap yet, it gets better. It gets better right here. What the Red Cross did not know was in that same 37208 zip code area, do you see any shelters? No. Red Cross didn't know that had no idea. Some people say a picture is worth a thousand words. I say a map is worth a million words. The Red Cross <laughs> had no idea. Uh, and so what was happening was in order to become a Red Cross shelter, it takes a lot. And, they, and the Red Cross was waiting for people from the community to step forward and come to the Red Cross. The people from the community were waiting for the Red Cross to come to the community. So guess what you end up with? No shelters or very few shelters, not enough shelters. Uh, so this was kind of a like I said, a qualitative approach to looking at community uh, vulnerability. In this case, the community obviously was very vulnerable. We will see how vulnerable it was very soon. Uh, and so I was, the Red Cross was very appreciative. I really liked the fact that they came, when we released these maps, the Red Cross showed up at Pearl Cone High School. Each student and their teacher got a uh, award certificate from the Red Cross. Uh, and we had Leland Statham come to the school and he actually presented the, uh, uh, certificates to the students so they knew him as you know a well-known African-American scientist that they see on TV every day uh, presenting those certificates that was really a, a great moment and I told those students I mean you know this isn't something that grandma or mama just gonna put on your her refrigerator and say, oh look at what my baby did you really affected change you'll see how much change they affected in the community because soon afterwards that was May and by September of 2009 uh, the Red Cross teamed up with the National Baptist Convention, which is the largest African-American religious organization, to develop more shelters in the underserved communities. And it makes sense because 80% of Red Cross shelters are faith-based organizations, so perfect partner to team up with. Uh, and so they really affected change. The Red Cross had to open their eyes and say, we have to do things differently to, to reach underserved communities. However, oh, let me acknowledgements, State Farm, insurance companies, Bev, Jacob, of course, Marva Woods was the principal there, all of my students, and all that, so uh, I always have to acknowledge those folks. But then, of course, so that was fall of 2009, we all know what happened in spring of 2010, the flood, Nashville flood, we all, how many of y'all remember the flood? Here for the flood, I remember that flood. Uh, shocking. Uh, it was an unprecedented event as far as we know. Now, they call this a 500 to 100,000 year flood event. Now, if you take my course in weather and climate, we'll do lots of math to explain what that is. But basically what it does not mean is that, it does not mean that we're good for the next 500 to 1,000 years. <laughs> you know, this type of event can happen this May all over again. Uh, it's, it's just, a, it's based upon probability. Uh, and because if you think about it, we only have about oh, maybe 150 years of, of climate data for Middle Tennessee, but we're, pre we're predicting, we're saying this is a 500 to 1,000 year event. So there, isn't that, doesn't that mean there's probably some uncertainty there? So even the uh, math behind saying that something's a 500 or 1,000 year event is uncertain. But what we really have to pay attention to is the elevation. Uh, you know, where, what is the level of, wh how, where's the river going to crest? Uh, and we know that there were some issues with the Army Corps of Engineers and the National Weather Service and Opryland. They're all suing each other now, and I don't have time to go into that. Um, billions of dollars in damages, uh, and of course we had the, uh, over two dozen fatalities. Uh, and so 10,000 people, so that was the flood. Uh, so here's a quick map. Uh, this red area, that's where the Nashville flood crested. And notice that is above, I know it's difficult to see, that is above the 500 year flood. You can barely see that dark blue area. That's the 500 year flood level. And so you can see that the elevation of the uh, flood in 2010 uh, was above the 500 year flood level, but probably somewhere between 500 to 1,000 years 
in elevation. Uh, and so it was a very significant event. Uh, I think they predicted five to six inches of precipitation, and you saw how much we really got, you know, 18, 17. It was just a, a low that just kept cycling, cycling, and pumping rain out over and over and over again for that uh, two-day period or so. Uh, so now what happened was the, in spite of the efforts of the National Baptist Convention, uh, we did, still did not have enough coverage of shelters. We were still very vulnerable in North Nashville, and we found out firsthand. So what happened was uh, St. Paul AME, AME Church wound up becoming an impromptu shelter. Uh, it says here, this is Reverend um, uh, Harold Moses Love Jr., who's now a state representative, uh, who gained a lot of notoriety as he uh, basically took charge of this situation. It says here he had, he thought that he was just going to commit one day to making me meals for people uh, who were affected by the flood, and they basically wound up becoming a um, headquarters for FEMA and other uh, Homeland Security and other agencies in North Nashville. So Reverend Love's church was not a shelter per se. He just said, let's just make some sandwiches for some displaced people, and they wound up by necessity having to become a shelter because as you saw on that map, we didn't have any shelters in that area, none uh, that were officially shelters. But fortunately, he was there and he uh, did a wonderful job, uh, a hero's uh, um, effort uh, in that part of town. Uh, so that was more of the quali qualitative look at Social vulnerability. Now I'm going to get into. I'm not going to get all. I took some. I didn't. I didn't include. I left some of the math slides out. Not that you. You know, math, lunch, kind of don't go together. Math right after lunch isn't a good thing. <laughs> you know. So what is social vulnerability? Well, well, there are just certain populations that are uh, more vulnerable to uh, hazards. Uh, they might not have. Might be not be as mobile as the rest of us. They might not have. Uh, might not speak uh, English as their first language. There are all kinds of things that make people uh, more vulnerable. If you remember Hurricane Katrina, uh, our more seniors, a lot of senior citizens made up a lot of the fatalities. Uh, another thing that we learned specific to the African American community is that there are a disproportionate number of African Americans who do not know how to swim. And that isn't necessarily fear of water. I mean, I mean many African American communities don't have pools. Many African American homes don't have pools in the backyard, uh, and a lot of us are concentrated in urban areas. So there are a lot of geographic factors that limit the um, uh, people learning how to swim. And then there are some social factors that are also, or I guess, aesthetic factors with some ladies that they don't want to get their hair wet and that's some other things. But uh, you've got to learn how to swim, uh, hair or no hair, uh, especially. <laughs> Especially uh, mothers, you know, and you heard about that sad story in Louisiana where the family, I think one child drowned and then four and five family members one after the other. I mean, that's the kind of thing that can happen uh, if you don't know how to swim. And it happened in my family. Uh, when I was maybe about 12, my oldest, one of my older cousins had just gotten a scholarship to college and we were at a summer picnic and he drowned. And after that, every child in our family had to learn how to swim all the way to lifeguard level. I mean, we didn't just stop at the little YMCA. I mean, I'm, I'm a trained lifeguard. Everybody, every child in our family after he drowned learned how to swim. But hopefully you don't have to have tragedies like that to get you to learn how to swim. But that's something that is really um, a, a, a serious issue in the African American community, c considering that with these extreme weather events, you're more likely to drown than anything else. It's not the wind that kills you in a hurricane, it's the water. Uh, and even a flash flood kills. And so learning how to swim is just something. Uh, and there's an organization here in Nashville called the Tennessee Aquatics Project, um, that, and that's what they do. Uh, they teach inner city children how to swim, among other things. Swim, scuba dive, everything. I think that's a great initiative on their part. Um, but not knowing how to swim, uh, other uh, criteria make people, more, certain populations more vulnerable, such as those in the 37208 zip code area. Uh, so here's some, some science stuff. Uh, the social vulnerability index is an index that we use to measure vulnerability. And so what we did with this project was create a, a, a SOBI, social vulnerability index score, 
for each census tract in Nashville. So we, cr we treated census tracts basically as neighborhoods. And census tracts don't align with neighborhoods, but that's sometimes the best level of um, geography that you can use to get data uh, for specific ge geographic regions. Uh, and so we use the track as our level. Now, now this was a, a unique application of the SOBI because it's normally used at the county level. Uh, and so we, this is a unique application using it at the census tract level. Uh, also, we use geographic information systems to create maps uh, and look at social vulnerability geographically. That's what all that says. On to the maps. It's, it's nice, bright. So here is um, social vulnerability based upon social demographic factors. Uh, in the purple are neighborhoods with lower vulnerability. So here's, let's see who, where my geographers are. What, what neighborhood is that? Yes. What's that? I uh, see a Bell Mead, that's far, in Forest Hills, it said Forest Hills. Yes, we have one geographer in the house. Yeah, that's Forest Hills, Oak Hill, Green Hills, of course, it's lower. And of course, you get the higher vulnerability, North Nashville, Bordeaux, uh, based upon social demographic factors. And we ex this is what we expected to find. Uh, we got some surprises later on in terms of wealth, of course, uh, lower vulnerability based upon your wealth here, obviously, we, we know that's in the forest. Uh, I don't know what's going on. I'm, I'm, I want to look at what's going on out here because I really don't know. I mean, that's something that's going on I need to look at later on. Um, here we have ethnicity. Now, when we go to ethnicity, what's, what's, where is that? What part of Nashville is that? What, what road is this? Murfreesboro. Murfreesboro Road, exactly. So the Murfreesboro Road, all of our um, uh, resettled ethnic groups uh, largely in that area. And notice that those vulnerabilities are higher in that region for a variety of reasons. Uh, of course, age, and this was not, there was no real distinct pattern, but, you know, we see uh, lower vulnerability, you got, you know, Vanderbilt and the colleges and Belmont in here, and then, of course, as we move farther out, we get higher vulnerability in some of the outlying areas with regard to uh, age. Uh, and then, of course, housing, lower vulnerability here in inner city, you know, and then, of course, when you get farther out, the vulnerabilities are actually higher as you get uh, in closer proximity to um, the river. Uh, and now this is the composite of all of the factors. And so you notice that the mo we expected to see the most vulnerable track to be in North Nashville, Bordeaux, somewhere around here, but it's actually out in that um, Nolensville Road, Murfreesboro Road corridor. And so when we throw in the, the language factor, that's what pushed that community higher. Uh, when, you, when you have English as a second language, supposedly. Uh, and I remember, I don't know if y'all remember this, for a long time, we didn't have any 911 operators who spoke Spanish. Do y'all remember that? And there was like one police officer on Metro's force that spoke Spanish, and when a call came into 911, they had to call him. Hopefully that's changed. I don't know if there's anyone from Metro Police in here, but that was, you y'all remember that? I saw that on the news. I couldn't believe it. This was, I mean, that wasn't very long ago. I'm saying that's been within the last five years. Hopefully that's changed. Uh, and so language can be a significant um, factor in terms of vulnerability. And I don't, know if, I don't know if you all remember this, but after the flood, um, a lot of people out here were renters. And do you all remember that the people, even after they were flooded out, a lot of the international community, what were the landlords doing? They were still charging them rent, even after they were flooded out. And, you know, I learned, I watch a lot of court shows. And, you know, I watch Judge Judy, you know, and I learned that, you know, you can't do that. You know, if, you're, if your property is uninhabitable, a landlord cannot continue to charge you rent. But what if you're not from here? What if you don't know the language? What if you're not familiar with the laws of this land? What are you going to do? You're going to keep paying even though you're living in a hotel and the landlord says pay up. And that happened. And luckily, they got attorneys and, and sued. And hopefully, they were successful. But that's our most vulnerable track there, not in North Nashville. Uh, if we look at the most socially vulnerable tract, uh, about 3,000 people, 46% are Hispanic or Latino, 45% of the population had less than high school population, 28% had no transportation, uh, and 87% renters, of course, which means they're vulnerable to any changes in their, uh, in their home. Uh, here is the, mo in amongst the mo most socially vulnerable tracts, these are the ones that were um, the most vulnerable, 70% were of some racial ethnic minority, um, the, the higher rates of poverty and high, lack, of high, lack of high school diploma, uh, about $47,000 or less me me median high uh, income, 
four and a half times higher unemployment. Household values were three hundred thousand dollars less than the most than the least vulnerable track. Four times more likely not to own a personal automobile, and fourteen times less likely to speak English proficiently. So those are some of the characteristics of our most uh, vulnerable tracks. Um, now, what's interesting is in terms of those shelters, the most shelters were, low in, were located in communities uh, with moderate social vulnerabilities. Uh, they were in the least socially vulnerable communities, those that need the least help. Uh, they had significantly higher evacuation capacity than those where people need the most help. So notice the evacuation capacity of the most vulnerable tracks versus those that are the least vulnerable. You had six shelters in the, in the least socially vulnerable communities. The people that need the most help, you only had two, two shelters. It's interesting. And so here's that map of the shelters relative to social vulnerability. Uh, and so, and then there's that most vulnerable track. Uh, and so, with, when we layered the flood elevation with the geographic locations of the uh, most social vulnerable tracks, uh, we found that those with the moderate to high levels, the most vulnerable tracks were in the path of the flood. Uh, which, and again, this flood could happen again. It will happen again. It's just a matter of when. Uh, and in that most vulnerable track, there were no shelters in the most, so our most vulnerable community, based upon our study, didn't have a shelter. Uh, the nearest shelter was about a half a mile away. Remember, a lot of those people had no cars. Uh, and it was very close to the flood la layer. Uh, so, and we've, we've done this presentation for Metro Planning and, and, the, Metro, and the Office of Emergency Management, so they've seen this already. Uh, and so hopefully they're going to act on it in some ways. Uh, uh, we obviously, we want to get emergency information announced in languages other than English. Uh, we need to address evacuation plans for people without call. What do you do? Uh, well, one of the responses is is preparedness. So the thing is, have three or four days of, of food and water in your home at all times because you, you know, FEMA's not going to be there tomorrow after the disaster. They might not be there the next day. They might not show up till next week. Uh, so you can't, uh, it's, it's, you can't depend upon help to come. You, know, you can't expect to be able to move. If you're immobile, you're going to have to maybe hunker down until help arrives. So you have to have supplies. Um, and one way that younger people are vulnerable, not that there aren't any younger people in this room, we're all young at heart, is that I noticed that a lot of my students, uh, if they buy a cheeseburger at McDonald's, they swipe a card. You know, they never carry it, everything's on the card. I was like, well, what happens to you when the lights go out, when there's no electricity? What can you do with that card? Nothing, you can't even eat it. So you gotta keep cash around. You have to keep cash around. I tell them, remember, I guess for them, remember Big Big Mama's got that, that jar somewhere that, with that house money? got to have that because when the lights go out you can and you can't go to the ATM with no electricity all that stuff runs on electricity um, and so that's one vulnerability of young people they, they're so not used to having cash when emergencies occur they're unable to, to get supplies um, and this was kind of a lofty goal let's decrease the socio-demographic gap in our in our communities to make communities less vulnerable that's a very lofty goal uh, that's a great goal to have. You have to aim high, as somebody once said. Um, also, a local registry of those who may need evacuation assistance. Uh, make flood insurance. Flood insurance education is important. Uh, a lot of people see that 100-year flood plain and say, oh, I'm safe. No, you're not. Well, a lot of people found out in 2010 that that really means that, you know, doesn't, I'm not saying it doesn't mean anything, but don't use that 100-year flood plain as a benchmark for buying or not buying flood insurance. Uh, and of course, the other hazard mitigation. Some of these things have already been put in place by local government. Uh, and so that's the question, are we ready? Because the flood of 2010 uh, can and will happen again. It could happen this spring. Uh, but we have to make sure that not only are the least vulnerable of us ready, we also have to look out for the least of these, the most vulnerable amongst us. And so that is our mission. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much. Um, so I have a bit of like a strange question. Um, a, a lot of the people in these socially vulnerable communities 
don't have vehicles. And, uh, but if you look at one of the major sources of global climate change, it's vehicles. Uh, so, uh, you know, we might think, well, it's much more important that everyone has a, has a car. But on the other hand, you want to say, well, actually, no, it's much more important that many fewer people have cars or that they drive them a whole lot less uh, and so on. So we've got a weird sort of contradiction here. And the contradiction is kind of s resolved or would be resolved by a serious investment in public transportation where, you know, you wouldn't use or need your own vehicle all the time. And when you think about um, uh, what it is for people to be able to get out of, out of floods, uh, I guess my question is, are we going to have uh, lots more buses with big wheels available next time round? I mean, is, there, is that part of the plan? Or uh, are people going to be left to walk uh, to shelters that may themselves be underwater? I mean, w when you said a lot of the socially vulnerable areas had very few shelters, you know, the thought that ran in, in my head is, well, those shelters are going to have to be <laughs> protected against the flood. Otherwise, you'd just be moving from your flooded house to a flooded shelter, which wouldn't be so, well, I be more company, but um, wouldn't be much of a gain. So is there a transportation solution to this as well as, um, I mean, uh, uh, is the local government actually p building that into their emergency plan? Yeah, well, one of the responses to the flood is, um, well, it's a new website called NERV. I don't know if any of y'all, how many of y'all are familiar with NERV, the Metro, Natural Metro Government's NERV? Well, it's, it's, it's NERV, N-E-R-V-E. Metro, Nashville, NERV. If you go onto the uh, national.gov site and search for NERV, uh, but what NERV is supposed to do is connect all the people that didn't connect during the Nashville flood. Uh, and so you can go there and supposedly um, find out what roads are closed or which, or which areas you should not go into. Um, and so that's one of the responses. Uh, now, I've, I've taken issue with that in that it's, you know, it's electronic. When the lights go out, you can't get on nerve. <laughs> you know, I mean, you can't put nerve on the radio, but, but it is what it is. I mean, it is, it is what it is. Um, a, second, a second thing uh, that, that emergency responders are doing as far as training is, again, is just getting people more prepared to hunker down and, and ride things out. I mean, that's been the main response that I've seen is to is all this preparedness. Are you prepared? Do you, are you ready? Do you have enough supplies in your home to, to last three and four and five days? Uh, does your family have a meeting place where you can all go, you know, when you, if your phones aren't operating uh, in advance? We, we, if something happens, we're all going to meet at spot X, uh, so on and so forth. Um, but, and I have some issues with some of the things that have happened after the, the, the flood with the local response. Uh, so for instance, there were a series of meetings uh, that really were that the city put on to roll out NERV uh, and to talk about these preparedness issues. Uh, I got an email, it was on the website. I think I got it on Facebook. So um, when the um, Bellevue meeting was held, I saw it on the news, it was packed, packed wall to wall. Uh, then they had a meeting in Pennington Bend. It was packed, wall to wall. Then they went and had one up the street from me at, at Luby, at the Luby Center. And I'm thinking, well, great. I mean, as, as much as we were affected in North Nashville and Bordeaux and where, you know, where um, Reverend Love's church was, I just knew our meeting would be packed. I got there. There were more people from the city there than people from the community. Why? I live in the community. Did I get a flyer? No. Did I get anything in the mail? No. Were there even flyers announcing the meeting at the Luby Center? No. Were there any flyers at the Monroe Street Kroger? No, they only announced it via email. I said, if you've ever been to a community meeting, especially in Buena Vista Heights, well, it was mostly folks who were retired who were, who were in those meetings. They might not have email, Facebook, and all these things that we have today. And so we have to communicate differently with different generations of people, obviously. And, and some of our more senior populations are the most vulnerable. And an email might not reach all of them. That's, that's one thing. Um, another, another response, which has been inter interesting, is what we did with those young people at Pearl Cone, 
in 2009. We can't do that today because right after we did that, uh, the, the um, Homeland Security created something called the National Shelter System. So now the locations of all those shelters is secret. <laughs> I'm serious. Are, are, now, you, are, you, are you allowed to say that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I thought the same thing. That doesn't make any sense. And so I, and, I mean, you actually have to log in and, and actually Dr. Fodderingham, when she uh, updated the study, had to get clearance to find out where the shelters were. And we found out actually there are less shelters now because the economic downturn resulted in churches losing money. So a lot of the um, faith-based organizations had to close down their shelters. So around the time of the flood, we only had about 63 shelters. But yeah, so, so, so the rationale for having these shelters be secret is twofold. A, it's the whole Homeland Security thing that if there was a different kind of emergency, maybe, you know, terrorists, bad people would target the shelters. You know, we're going to create a diversion, all the people run to the shelters, and then we, you know, bomb the shelters. So that's one part of the rationale. The second part of the rationale is exactly what if you say, okay, I know that this church is my Red Cross shelter. It's down the street from me. That's where we're going to go in the event of a flood. And again, electricity's out. Something happens at night. Um, you can't see, and you go to that shelter, and that shelter's underwater. Now what? So what the emergency responders want to be able to do is hold on to the shelters uh, until the event occurs, which is somewhat problematic, and then tell people, shelter A is open. Don't go to shelter B. It's flooded. Shelter C is damaged. And in some cases, the people who, who um, manage the shelters are unable to get there. So during the flood, a lot of the sh where there were shelters, the people who were supposed to be at the shelters couldn't get to the shelters. So people might, they don't, they don't want people to go to a shelter that's locked up. And so that's another thing. Uh, and so I was surprised at that. I can't remember. There was a significant percentage of the shelters that couldn't even be opened during the flood because the people couldn't even get to the shelters. Uh, and so I understand that rationale. You don't want people going to shelters that are damaged or flooded out. You know, the whole the terrorist piece, maybe, you know, I don't know. But, but that's the rationale. So you, you and I, we don't know where those shelters are. We'll find out um, when something happens. Again, that, what's problematic about that is what if there are no lights and no phones and no electricity, then what? But that's, that's just... Okay, just, just one more question, then we open this to the uh, audience. Um, one of the things that struck me in your presentation is that a, a lot of the vulnerability uh, or the dimensions of vulnerability that you're describing are also social justice issues in a, in a broader sense. So that although this is to do with um, flooding, let's say, or storm damage or whatever, the people who would be affected are already being affected uh, by, for example, not, not speaking English or being poor those kinds of things are not good for them even without a storm. And uh, I think that, I mean, when you talked about not, like not having email and not being communicated with, this seems to be so central to a community that you can reach people, you can talk to them, you can connect with them and so on. I mean, ha has anyone said, you know, well, we need to get preparedness, but we actually need to raise a level of uh, English teaching, for example, in, in Nashville, and I say that you know, in the downtown public library, which is, you know, deeply committed to um, education at that level, to literacy. And it, it strikes me that just from what you've been saying, that that would make a huge difference if people could read leaflets and they could, you know, uh, talk to each other about what to do when uh, and be talked to by local officials and so on. Am I right? I mean, the, the, the kind of literacy is also a kind of huge but maybe concealed oh. dimension to this. Oh yeah, absolutely. <coughs> and that's, um, uh, I don't remember the last time I checked, I think there are 117 la languages spoken in metro schools now. Uh, and so, so in our community is very diverse. Um, it, we've, got, we've, we've gone a long way since, you know, hee haw. We've got all kinds of people here. We've, this is the, you know they call Nashville Little Kurdistan because there are more Kurds here than any place else in the world outside of Kurdistan. And so we have Ethiopians, Somalians, Sudanese, uh, Hmong, all kinds of folks here. So yeah, just making uh, communication easier is, is another thing. Um, but then looking at the, the bigger picture, so to speak, um, A, this 
wealth gap, I just read a report earlier, the wealth gap is growing. I mean, the, 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 the gap between the wealthiest folks in this country and the, the, the least of these is growing significantly. It's grown significantly over the past 20 years. It's really astounding. Uh, and so, again, that, you know, that lofty goal of closing that gap is something that is, uh, you know, it's almost a spiritual question. Um, but looking at this as a global question, uh, you know, we were horrified by Katrina, we were horrified by Hurricane Sandy, um, but do you know that in Bangladesh and in the, with the, um, that this type of flooding happens every year during monsoon season? Every year, millions of people are displaced, millions of people are flooded, and we just don't see that on the front page of USA Today. And so we have to sometimes look at this as, as relative um, in that sometimes, you know, as bad as something can be here, it can be much worse in other places. Um, and so and at least we have the resources to rebuild, whereas in other places, um, I mean, there are places in, um, you know, remember the tsunami of maybe about 10 years ago, maybe 2004 tsunami, I mean, there are places that have look exactly the same in other places, parts of the world. But if you go to in, in New Orleans, it isn't completely rebuilt, but you know, things, it doesn't look like it did, it looked in 2006, definitely. So it, we have to look at this relatively. Okay, we're gonna uh, ask the audience for uh, questions. Any, any questions? All right, yes, gentlemen over there. You, uh, yeah, please use the mic, because we record Did you look at the um, uh, availability of boats to anybody in this situation? Uh, no, I, I don't know if that would be something that would be borne out, and we use the U.S. Census as a primary database, uh, but that's interesting. I mean, that might be a good, something that we could look at, because if we look at Hurricane Katrina, and even here, I mean, a lot of the people that got rescued were rescued by volunteers who had boats, so maybe a um, database of people who have boats who could be on call, that would be something to look at, yeah, definitely. We didn't, we didn't include that in our Thank you. Uh, that was a fascinating presentation, and uh, just the work that you did with the students in and of itself seems really valuable and change at the most fundamental level. I did want to, I had two questions, and one was kind of the other side of the benefits of making everything electronic. Um, and one is um, electronic medical records that after Katrina, there was a big push for electronic medical records because so many people who were diabetic or who were on dialysis were displaced without any records at all and the doctors were guessing mm. about what to do. And sort of humorously, this lady I met who was in the Superdome for like five days with her husband, they were both retired, and she told me, she said to him, lying there on the floor, she's like, I told you you should have got direct deposit <laughs> for your social security check. Which he's, and she said he wouldn't get direct deposit because he wanted to see his money. So she was better off because she was getting her money uh, even so. So that was just one thing. I think there is another side to that. I understand when the lights go out, things don't work, but some things still do. Um, but then it, it kind of more broadly, it really struck me when Hurricane Sandy hit New York that uh, there was a big contrast between New York and New Orleans during Katrina. And specifically between the two oldest hospitals in the United States are Bellevue in New York and Charity that was in New Orleans. And Bellevue had generators on higher floors. I mean, New York had like so many regulations in place that the impact of that hurricane on that city, although it was bad, was nothing compared to what, I mean, Charity never reopened and Bellevue, they were complaining about like things not being cold, you know, or something like that. Whereas in Charity, they had 400 pound people on the 10th floor and trying to take them down by stretcher in the stairs. 
Yeah, I think um, <laughs> yeah, with regard to Sandy, um, yeah, I think Hurricane Katrina taught inner cities a lot about the um, potential impacts of extreme weather events. Uh, and it also taught cities that even though you're, you think you're immune, uh, that this global climate change is going to bring storms like Sandy, which was also unprecedented, farther north. Uh, and so New York was, and of course after 9-11, New York just in general uh, was probably better prepared for any kind of an event. Um, and in terms of, yeah, the electricity question, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I agree. I mean, some things you should have electronically and, um, you know, in hard copy or cash on hand and also perhaps direct deposit. So, but I, I wasn't talking about like going back to the Stone Age, but, but, but yeah, definitely uh, you need to take advantage of both realms of, uh, of uh, provisions and supplies and prepare. Yeah, well, that, that's actually changing. Um, like I said, I've been on both sides of the coin, so to speak. Uh, I've been a physical scientist. So meteor meteorologists, climatologists are what we call physical scientists. And then you have social scientists, sociologists, health sciences, and so on and so forth. For a long time, climatologists and meteorologists would only talk to other climatologists and meteorologists. They weren't talking to social scientists. Didn't happen. Uh, so that was called climatology 1.0. But now, I'm not making this up, now that we're in what's called climatology 2.0, and this is new, I mean, this is new where climatologists are actually saying, well, look, maybe we need to talk to some sociologists and uh, urban planners and, and other things. And if you, it's hard to describe the, the physical science world, but these are people that just spend most of their time with algorithms and and computers and models and, and those humans, you know, I, I don't know, I don't want to deal with that human. But, you, I mean, I actually went to a um, presentation once, I'll never forget it, there was a uh, physical scientist who was studying um, the, the, um, how acid mine laced water would be released, runoff from mines and how it would run off from these mines and how uh, you'd have arsenic and all these toxic metals in this water that was running off of these mine sites and he was spending all his time. So someone in the audience raised a question and, and they said, well, are there any human populations downstream from the mine? And he said, you know, I never really thought about that. <laughs> it never crossed his mind. He was just fascinated at the dissolution of the chemicals and the, and the mix in the, in, the, in the mine waste, but, but whether or not it was gonna impact people, never. And that's, that's sometimes, I hope I'm not insulting any physical scientists in here, uh, but now they're starting to talk and say, maybe this, you know, we start looking at this uh, global uh, climate change issue, uh, there are gonna be some, some health ramifications, there are gonna be some social ramifications uh, there are going to be some, there's this whole climate justice uh, thing that, that where people, you know, when, when climate change happens and when global warming happens, I mean, you know, those of us in the so-called developed countries are not going to feel it nearly as much as people in other parts of the world. You know, I tell my students all, my, all the time. First, I ask them, what's your drinking water source? Half of them don't know. You know, when you flush, where does it go? They have no idea. Um, I said, but in, in, uh, how did you get 
water they turn to tap. And I said, we'll complain. Some of us, oh, I don't drink tap or, or it doesn't taste right. I said, I, and I told my young ladies in the class, I said, when you were 14 and 15 and you're a little girl, your job might have been to walk four or five miles to get water. That's how other people in the other part of the world get water. Well, I wouldn't have done that. I said, you either get that water or you die. Oh, yes, you would. So we're somewhat spoiled here uh, as far as what might happen uh, in the event of global climate change. But then again, and this is why I don't watch Survivor, you know, who would really survive on Survivor? Let's get five of us and get five Bushmen from the South. Who's going to survive on that island? <laughs> you know, we'd be done in, in the first half hour of the show. Uh, so it, it's, all, it's all relative. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Dr. Padgett. Two questions. Have you had this same presentation presented at local schools or local universities or local community centers? Have you done the same presentation that you've done today anywhere else where the educators, the students? Yeah, this is only the second time we've uh, presented this. We just finished this study. Uh, so the first time was uh, for the Meharry Vanderbilt uh, Community Engaged Research Corps. Uh, and so we invited Metro Planning, the Office of Emergency Management, the emergency responders from the health department were there. We had a really, you know, people who in our local community who needed to hear this information uh, were there. Uh, this is the second time it's been presented here. Uh, and in a couple of weeks, uh, there's going to be a climate justice conference at uh, Dillard University in, actually it's an HBCU, climate, historically black college university climate justice conference in New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, the first week in April. So they will, we'll present it to a whole host of HBCU students. Uh, and then uh, that same week, it'll be presented in Washington, D.C. at the um, uh, National Environmental Justice Conference and Training, National, Justice, National Environmental Justice Conference and Training um, Conference. I can't think of the word. But, and that'll be in D.C. So yeah, we're going to actually start presenting it nationally. The other part of the question is, oftentimes the news channels will present disaster workshops in the communities, and to my knowledge, they've never presented one of those in the inner city. They're always in the rural, suburban areas. Is there any way you could convince them to bring those disaster workshops that the TV stations present to end the inner city? Oh, the television? Oh, um, yeah, I just went to one. Well, yeah, well, interesting enough, right after Hurricane Katrina, those inner city emergency response, I mean, that, I guess that was a hot thing. I mean, I went to one at TSU. We had one at the Magruder Center. Um, there were others. They had churches involved. And now that's kind of slowed down. I don't know whether, I'm sure not everybody is prepared and there's no more education that can be spread. But yeah, that's something that needed to continue. I was surprised I haven't heard in the last three or four years of any of those. And they might be going on just because I didn't hear about it doesn't mean it's not happening. But definitely they were happening after Hurricane Katrina, just getting, uh, even looking at low income population saying, we know you're low income, et cetera, et cetera, but here's what you need to do to prepare. Uh, if you need to get your whole family together to get these supplies, but you're going to have to be able to ride out three or four days before the Calvary rides in to save you, supposedly. So we have time just for one more question and a short answer. I'm wondering if uh, there is any discussion of how to save our city buses because last uh, during the flood we lost a bunch of buses because the uh, lot where they uh, store them and the ma maintenance uh, place down there got flooded. Yeah, I'm assuming that with this um, new initiative, this NERV initiative, that that's getting everybody who could be affected talking to one another. So you have the, Amer the National Weather Service, talking to metro schools, and metro schools talking to the Office of Emergency Management. You know, that wasn't happening before. Everybody was just in their little silos, and then that's, you know, that's what happens when you are in a silo. Metro schools didn't know what was going to happen necessarily, didn't get those buses out of harm's way, and hopefully this has taught us, sometimes we have to learn lessons the hard way, uh, and so hopefully we've learned and we're gonna be better the next time that something like this happens. I think it's time we thanked our speaker and uh, thank you all for coming.